Welcome to everybody to another fun and exciting computer science class. I'm your host, Dr. McKinney. And uh, let's have a quick peek at the Discord and see who all's here, which is like nobody. And who's on the stream, which is like um, also nobody. Is the stream actually live? Yep. Uh, oh, hold on. It looks like I screwed something up. Uh, there we go. Okay, so, good. And nobody's watching. Nobody's on the effing stream. Or at least not yet. So, um, alright, well, six people. Okay, wonderful. We're going to have fantastic attendance today. Uh, so, let's, uh, let's get to it. So, uh, I'd actually like to start with this article that was on the Washington Post, uh, uh, earlier. Uh, it came out, I think, Saturday. Uh, which is basically a uh, uh, some coverage of the the whole COVID-19 thing and what flattening the curve means. Um, anyway, so uh, what I wanted to, to do specifically with this is talk about some of the little simulations that they ran. So uh, at the very beginning, they're sort of doing a simulation about, you know, imagining people as just these little circles. And if they kind of bounce around, then uh, when they touch each other, we'll call that is that they're um, uh, coming into contact. And uh, if somebody is sick, which they denote in orange, uh, comes into contact with, say, somebody who's healthy, which they denote in blue, uh, then they infect them. And, of course, um, with this particular disease, um, people get sick, but eventually they recover. Um, and uh, although uh, possibly, of course, they could die. So we'll take, uh, take this first simulation here, which is assuming that you start with one sick person out of 200 total people, and you just let people kind of mosey about, uh, then what happens is eventually everybody gets infected. And, of course, over time, uh, people get over the infection, and so eventually you end up with a situation where everybody has recovered, uh, and you get this sort of bell, bell curve shape thing. So when people are talking about flattening the curve, what they're talking about is this sort of orange curve there. Um, and uh, then they do a few other things like, okay, what about if you have, um, say, a quarantine uh, where you restrict people in a certain area, but then you lift that quarantine? So this would be kind of the situation where, like, say, somebody... Uh, uh, flies to a different country, and originally when they get there, nobody in that country has the disease, uh, but eventually the same sort of thing happens. Uh, the curve is slightly flattened out. It takes longer for everybody to get the infection, uh, but eventually everybody gets it. And uh, then they do some other simulations. So like here on this one, for example, uh, for social distancing, what they're doing is saying, okay, well, let's suppose that uh, most people aren't allowed to move around, then uh, eventually everybody probably still will get the disease, or many of them will, um, but the rate at which it's transmitted is, of course, a lot slower um, in this particular case. And uh, over the time scale of the simulation, if we let this run a little while, then I bet the rest of the people would get it, or most of them would. Uh, and then it, to contrast this to a pretty extreme example where you sort of have like a lockdown, uh, then the idea here is that uh, while, yes, the virus gets transmitted, eventually everybody who has it recovers, and uh, they're not coming into contact with susceptible individuals often enough, and once they're recovered, it doesn't matter if they come into contact with people. Uh, so what we're going to do is actually use Scratch to program kind of a simulator sort of like this. Um, and uh, in doing so, we'll uh, be able to talk about uh, variable scope, uh, which is a, a term uh, that describes how uh, variables uh, are in a program, sort of where, where they're uh, limited to. Um, and also we can talk about instances of objects. So um, if, let's go into Scratch and let's create a new project. And then I'm going to call this 
COVID-19 simulator. Okay, and the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the stupid cat. Um, and like in the um, like in the uh, simulation, I'm going to just use this ball as a um, as our thing, and the ball happens to come with a bunch of costumes, so we'll use sort of the same color scheme here. We'll use blue to indicate uh, normal. Uh, we'll use orange to indicate uh, infected, and we'll use pink to indicate recovered. Uh, and then in this case, we're not going to use uh, any of the other uh, ones. Um, now, this thing is a little bit too big, so the first thing I'm going to do is just say, uh, when green flag is clicked, uh, let's just shrink the size to, let's try 50% and see how that looks. Uh, that's probably good. We'll, let's shrink it just a little bit more. Okay, that's good enough. Um, okay, so uh, we got a couple things to do. The first is that we have to get the thing moving. Uh, the second is that we really need 200 of these things. Now, it would probably, you guys can realize, that it would be a bad idea to have 200 individual sprites, all of which are just like this ball. We could do that, but that's a really bad idea. So what we're going to use instead is something called cloning. So we'll sort of define what the master ball object is, uh, and then we can make sort of copies of it without having to have a bunch of copies of the actual sprite. Um, okay, but we'll worry about that later. So for, the, for now, let's just get this thing moving around. So um, under motion, we've got a couple of options. Uh, we can do uh, movement, go to a random position, and in fact, we're going to do that to start with, and that way every time we run the program, the orange ball starts in a random place. Okay, and then uh, what we want to do is we want to have the thing start moving around. So we want it to move into a random direction. Uh, and so the, the way that we can do that is we can point it in a random direction. Uh, now if I say point in direction 90, uh, then and let's say then move 10 steps. Um, well, okay, so let me put a weight in there because otherwise you won't be able to see it. So let's do this. Um, okay, so direction 90 is defined to be uh, to the right. Uh, direction 0 is up, 90 is to the right, 180 is straight down. 270 is straight to the left, uh, so it's measured clockwise, kind of like compass settings. Okay, so uh, if I have it point in a random direction, well, let me put the weights back in so we can actually see this. I can get the random here by, say, pick a number between 0 and 360. And then every time we run this, the thing will move in some random direction. Okay, so um, that um, uh, that gets the the basics of the movement, but we want this moving to happen repetitively forever. So I'm going to remove the weights, and we'll just get rid of them there. Uh, we want to move the certain number of steps. Uh, a bunch of times, and um, so let's do, um, uh, then we'll use this thing here, if on edge, bounce, and then I need to repeat this basically forever, like so. Okay, so what the if on edge, bounce does is kind of nice. Basically, it just means uh, it automatically does that. Okay, now that's maybe a little bit too fast for our simulation, so let's cut the speed down a little bit. Okay, and maybe that's still a little bit too fast, so let's let's do it, say, at 3, and we'll get the idea here. Okay, all right, so we've got the motion going, and um, 
Now what we want to do is basically create copies of this thing. Um, so in order to um, create copies of this thing, what I'm going to do is we're going to make a uh, clone. Okay, and the creating a clone is here. Okay, so I'm going to move this to when I start as a clone. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to initially show, and I'm initially going to hide, and then I'm going to say this a hundred times. Okay, so now what will happen is we get a hundred clones created, and they're all going to start to bounce around. Okay, so maybe a hundred was a little bit ridiculous, so let's just do 20 for the time being. Okay, so we get 20 copies of the ball, and then this is the brilliance of using the cloning, is that we don't actually have to write code for each separate ball. They are all running this code here, uh, the when I start as a clone code. Okay, uh, so the, the sort of uh, there's one ball, which is like the master, and then all the balls that you actually see are just copies of it, uh, each with its own random direction, and uh, in this case, they're all moving at the same speed. Okay. So, um, one thing we could do is we could say um, if uh, that maybe not every ball should have the same speed. Okay, um, and that speed could be random, but each ball might have a different speed. Okay, so what I could do is say, all right, let me create a variable, and let's call this, say, ball speed. But then I have an option here, and the options are for all sprites or for this sprite only. Okay, so basically, uh, this idea is about variable scope. So if I create it for all sprites, then every single sprite, if I create, put like the cat sprite back in, would be able to access and uh, use the variable ball speed. Okay, so let me actually make a variable and let me call this a global variable. And then I'll create another one for this sprite only called a local variable. Okay, so within the ball, we can see the global variable and we can see the local variable, but that's attached to just to the ball. If I create another sprite, say the apple, and I go to the apple, the you'll notice that in my variable list, the local variable doesn't appear. Um, so, uh, how do we get to what, A-Town? Uh, well, I'll keep going. So, just tell me what it was you were asking how we get to. Uh, okay, so the, the apple can see the global variable, uh, but it cannot see the local variable because that's only, uh, only for the ball itself. Okay, so perfect. So let's get rid of the apple. Um, and then uh, under the ball, let me change the local variable's name to ball speed, say. And then the global variable we don't need, so I'll just delete that. Okay, and then when the clone is created, let's set the ball speed to a random number that's between, let's say, 1 and 5. Okay, so now if we run it, watch what happens. Okay, uh, so you'll notice that uh, well, it kind of looks like they're all moving the same speed to me, um, which is interesting, because uh, they should be all different speeds. Um, okay, 
hang on one second. Let's look back at the variables. Uh, ball speed. Uh, let me delete it and remake it for this sprite only. Okay, set ball speed to operators random number between I'll do 1 to 10 because that way we'll see if some of them are going really fast uh, and they're all going really slow okay that's not supposed to happen um, so what's supposed to happen and I'll have to figure out for a minute why it's not is that a local variable um, is not only specific to the ball but it's specific to all clones of it so, um, actually, why don't we take this and let's do that. Okay, something's not right because they should be all moving at different speeds. Um, I'm not sure why that's not working. Uh, all right, well, well, we'll just not worry about that for right now. So let me just say 1 to 5, and um, in this case, they're all going at whatever speed they're going at. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll worry about the ball speed later. Um, but... Um, um, let's see, uh, what is the reason that we hide the first set of code? What would happen if repeat 20 came after when the flag twig, uh, was clicked? Uh, okay, so the repeat 20, all this is doing is creating uh, copies of the original ball. And um, I just wanted 20 of them. So that happens immediately when the program starts. And then when a ball is created as a clone then this part is what actually happens. Um, and if this happened right after the flag clicked, uh, it would actually be the same thing. Uh, what we would see is, right, things get created and that's it. Um, okay, so, uh, so let's get rid of that for there. Um, okay, so now uh, we've got the balls uh, moving around and we basically want uh, if they touch each other uh, then uh, and we want to start with say maybe one infected ball okay so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make a second copy of the ball and I'll call this this one um, infected ball and then I'm going to change its costume to uh, I think blue we said was going to be, or no, we said orange would be infected and blue would be susceptible. Okay, so uh, so now under the infected ball, let's take, um, let's duplicate all of this code. Okay, so we'll just do control, let's see, so when, uh, when sprite is clicked, um, we will, uh, so let's duplicate this and copy it to the infected ball. Uh, where'd the code go? Uh, code went away. All right, well, whatever. So we'll, uh, we'll make the size, set size to 30%. Okay, and so now we have a bunch of uh, blue uh, uninfected balls flying around and then this one infected ball and then we need to make it so that um, if the uh, if an orange ball touches a blue ball or vice versa then it passes the infection to that thing okay so what we'll do under here is while it's moving oh guys I just realized while the speed didn't uh, change uh, I was being an idiot because I had them moving three steps always. And so all I want there is I want them to move ball speed steps. Okay, so now watch. 
Um, they all seem to be moving the same speed. Okay, that's really annoyingly weird. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, okay, well, we'll I'll figure that out later. Uh, okay, so um, the um, uh, let's see, what do we want to do? We want to make it so that if a blue ball touches an orange ball, then um, it um, uh, infects the blue ball. Okay, so that means we need to have a conditional. Okay, of an if-then sort of thing. So if, um, and then we want sensing. So if it is touching the infected ball, then we want to do something. Oops, and we'll put that. Oh, crap. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, no, there we go. Okay, so if it's touching the infected ball, then we need to change uh, its costume, uh, switch costume to the orange one, which means infected was ball A. Okay, so now anytime a blue one touches this original orange ball, then it will change to uh, being infected. Okay, uh, also the orange ball's not moving around, so let's actually get that in there. Um, so let's take um, this that I meant to duplicate and, okay, that's really annoying. The code's not going there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna put this down in my backpack. And then come over here. Oh, not that one. This one. Okay, so now the initial infected ball will move around randomly just like the other ones. Okay, but uh, only this ball, it's sort of stuck up here at the top, this was the original one. So notice that if a blue ball touches this one, it changes to the infected status. But if it, um, um, but the other ones do not. Okay, so like that blue one just touched that orange one, uh, but this one isn't the the object called infected ball. Okay, so uh, what we're going to have to do is basically make it so that uh, rather than having two different categories here uh, of ball and infected ball and make a ball turn into an infected ball, uh, is there uh, is this how you would also make the balls bounce off each other? Um, we can do that, yes. Um, that's going to take a little bit more. We're going to have to add some stuff to the code, um, but we can do that. So, um, so for example, Reese, if we want to get that working, then what we would do is under motion. Um, so we've got this random direction. So what I'm going to do under variables, so I'm going to make a new variable, and I'm going to call this ball direction. And then uh, under the regular ball, I'm also going to make uh, that. Okay, so this may seem a little weird that I have two different variables, both called ball direction, but one of them is specific to the infected ball. That will be our initial... Um, sick person, and then all the other ones will have their own ball direction. So when I say point in direction, what I'm going to do is actually say set ball direction to a random number between 0 and 360, and then point in the direction, ball direction, and then move, oh, I see why this wasn't working. I forgot to change that. Okay, so uh, now there we go. Now all of them are moving at different speeds. Okay, so it, it helps if your professor is is competent. Uh, okay, so that got them all moving in 
at different speeds and we now have variables for their directions. So um, what I wanted to do with the bouncing is, um, so how do they, let's go back to the, the, the simulator here. So let's pay real close attention. Well, here, let me go up to the first one, uh, this one. So how do the balls bounce when they run into each other? Okay, so how is the how are the bounces happening? Kind of looks like they're happening like they should in physics class, right? Where you you have sort of a, a sum of momentum's kind of thing going on. Um, for yeah, it looks like an elastic collision. Okay, um, for for simplicity, write this instant because I don't want to have to do a bunch of trigonometry. Uh, with you guys is let's just make it that when they bounce it reverses direction okay that's not realistic to physics but it's good enough for um, for uh, for our purposes okay so what we could do is say if touching ball one switch the costume to the infected costume and also change the um, the direction by 180 okay so that would mean that it would it would move now in a 180 degree uh, direction from what it was heading in okay so if we do that okay it didn't look like anything bounced did they uh, let's start it over Nope, didn't look like anything bounced properly. Uh, let's try it again. Nope, no bouncing happened. Okay, so um, we need to, oh, I know why. Because what we need to do is, so we change the variable, then we need to actually make it point in that direction. So we need to change the variable and then point in the direction. So what we had done before I added this little part right here is that I changed the value of ball direction, but I never told the ball to face in that direction. Okay, so now when that when the uh, the initial sick guy is right here, see somebody bounces off of him. Okay. Okay, good. So, uh, so we got that working. And um, now what we should do is we need to have it um, so that uh, balls that get infected can then infect other balls. Okay, so we've got the initial ball factored in, but we don't have the other ones. So uh, for that, how can we tell if we're touching an infected ball? Well, that would be sort of this orangish color. And one of the things I'm going to do for simplicity is let me come into the costumes and here instead of this thing I'm gonna just fill it with an orange color and make it solid okay similarly with the blue one I'm gonna fill it with a blue color and um, uh, this blue color there so the infected one okay so then here I need the uh, orange color Okay, so I want this orange color that I've got right there, and um, so I'm going to take the orange color, let's pick the orange color, and I'm going to plop it right there. Oops. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted a solid fill. Okay, so pick that orange color. Okay, and then under this ball, I want to do the same color. Okay, so now I've got those guys set, and I'll go ahead and do the same thing with the pink uh, for the recovered, which we haven't added in yet, but we will later. Okay, so uh, just made them solid colors basically for convenience, and then the infected ball starts orange, and the regular ball start blue, and then I'm going to... Under variables, I'm going to uncheck the little check marks 
um, just so that it hides the the display of the variables values and that way I just I don't have to, to worry about them um, okay so what this means is that we don't necessarily want to be touching the infected ball only but rather we can say if we are touching the color of the infection so I'm going to change this to that and then obviously the color isn't correct so I can um, I can either pick the color through the color picker or if I click this little thing down here at the bottom I can choose a pixel of the desired color and that will uh, pick the correct thing okay so now anytime anybody touches uh, an orange ball um, okay so they're not infecting um, okay hold on let's make sure I didn't mess something up with the costumes code oh uh, I think I need to under looks I need to make sure that uh, the blue ones start uh, with the blue costume okay there we go so now when a blue one touches an orange one so hopefully that'll happen here okay so it changed color and they bounce and so on okay um, okay so we've got them bouncing around and now uh, what isn't happening uh, it didn't look like all of them were doing this um, oh I see what I did messed up uh, here I had the, the wrong set of codes so I want it to be uh, this ball here I also need to have the uh, the touching the orange color so that is this guy here okay so I just forgot to change it in both instances okay so now let's run it and okay now you notice that some stuckness is getting ha happening here um, basically the the balls are continually touching each other and it's kind of screwing up the the simulation okay so what we would want to do is um, um, if uh, well, under the infected ball let's see um, we need to uh, change uh, ball speed and uh, we needed to say set ball direction to the random number and point in ball direction and then if it's touching we needed to um, change ball direction by 180 and uh, point in ball direction okay so basically just duplicate all the changes we made uh, to the motion part for the infected ball and let's see if that fixes nope they're still kind of getting stuck but we can hopefully uh, fix that um, so uh, essentially what's happening when they get stuck is that they run into each other and then they're trying to switch directions and then they run into each other again so this isn't the this sort of changing directions is not exactly the best way to do it as we're seeing here uh, but we kind of get the idea as to what's supposed to happen so okay uh, so we won't worry about that for right now uh, we just to, to get the idea um, okay so uh, how else could we doctor this up a little bit so what else could we do to make this more realistic or more like the the simulation we saw in the Washington Post so what ideas do you guys have of course you would say that Reese add physics 
and yeah, I could add the physics. I'll deal with that later um, to make the, the bouncing a little bit more realistic, but... Okay, so what other what other uh, things did we see in the the simulation? Okay, so what happens after uh, something's infected for a little while? Okay, add people who are immune or uh, in the context of this, the pink ones are people who have recovered from the infection, okay? Uh, so yeah, recovered balls, but I don't know how they would recover if they were all bunching together. Um, well, okay, so that, uh, the bunching part is really just a problem with the code, not with uh, the idea, but let's think about it this way. If you have five people who are infected with the virus and you put them all in the same room, well, they're not going to reinfect each other. They already have the disease. Okay, so, uh, but if you put them in five separate rooms or they keep moving around, well, they still have the disease. So it doesn't really change anything uh, for them to be uh, the fact that they're kind of clumping up on us. So what we want to do then is say, all right, the, um, there's some period of time when... Uh, after becoming infected where you become uh, that you recover from it or perhaps die um, and in fact we could add in the death um, death category if you wanted to so let's um, let's actually take um, under backdrop so I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to call this infected I'm also going to have Susceptive would help if I could spell. How the hell do you spell that? Um, susceptible. Okay. Uh, I'm not like a dude with a PhD or anything. Okay. So I've got susceptible, infected, and I'll also make a variable called recovered. Okay, and I'm going to get rid of this stupid my variable thing. Now, I made all of those global variables. Um, yeah, so, uh, so what the idea here is that I'm going to start with, uh, so under control, or uh, sorry, events, well, initially, we have um, one infected, okay, and we have... Um, zero recovered and then the blue ball here is when I start as a clone let's increment the uh, susceptible by one okay so what this means is that every time we create a clone of the the original blue ball and we end up creating 20 of them then we will change the number of susceptible by one okay so if I run this real quick we have 20 susceptible, one infected, and then when they start touching each other, okay, we change color, but then what we want to do is if it's touching orange, okay, we want to change the, um, the variable to infected, okay? So we could say uh, change uh, infected by one, okay? So let's run that and see what happens. Oops. The other thing we need to do is under the backdrop, uh, I need to set the initial amount of susceptible to zero because otherwise it's going to count wrong. Okay. All right. All right, so look what happened here. So what's happening? Because these things are keeping touching each other, the infected number is going through the roof even though there's really only three balls there. Okay, so we need to do something a little different to make this um, make this work better. Okay, so what about um, let's add um, let's add a variable to the ball, and let's call this variable its state. Okay, and here's the way I'm going to think about the ball's state. 
I'm going to think about, uh, I'm going to use a number to encode what state the ball is in. So let's say that state 0 is susceptible, state 1 is infected, and state 2 is recovered. Well, if I'm infected and I come into contact with another infected ball, do I need to increase the number of infected? No. So what we could do is we could say, there's two ways we could do this. Under control, let's do an if. If the state is 1, um, OK, let's say if the state is 0. OK, if the state is 0, then that means that we are not infected. OK, and so if we touch the uh, orange thing, and if we then also are in currently in state 0, then we should change the infected by 1, because we just got infected, and then set our state to be one, which is going to stand for infected. Okay, so let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so now our infection numbers are realistic because the ball can only be infected once. Okay, now we still got the bouncing problem to worry about, and we'll deal with that later. Um, but um, uh, yeah, otherwise it looks pretty good. And we have the number of infected, oh, OK, uh, is now at 20 because it, everybody was infected uh, except for our, except for one dude. OK, so we should end up with 21 infected when all is said and done. Uh, but why does it say we still have 20 susceptible? OK, so what uh, what's going on there? What should the susceptible be right now? Uh, until that moment right there when it touched. Okay, so what should the susceptible be? Bueller. Uh, the susceptible should be, well, one or zero now because all of them are orange. Okay, so why isn't it that? Uh, it isn't that because I never told the code to deduct one from the susceptible. So if I become infected, that means that I'm no longer susceptible. So I should change the number of susceptible guys by minus one. So every time I change from one state to the other, I should add to the new state and, de and uh, delete from the previous one. OK, so let's run this again and see what happens. OK, so should get hopefully a bounce here soon. Of course, it's going to go nice and slow here. But we'll get one eventually. Right. OK, so there we go. We had a bounce. And um, so then now each time somebody becomes susceptible, or sorry, infected, the number of susceptible goes down. And uh, eventually, if we just let this run for a long enough, then we'd end up with everybody uh, infected. OK, so uh, does that make sense? So next, what we'd like to do is add in the fact that balls can recover. OK, so. Um, Balls can recover in some amount of time. So um, let's say, for example, let's say, for example, we do uh, five seconds uh, that after becoming infected, you stay infected for five seconds and then you become recovered. OK, so what we need to do there is we need to have a global variable. And I like to use the backdrop where I put all my global variables and under sensing. Uh, I can have a timer, okay? And so I'm going to reset the timer when we start the program, okay? And then uh, that way 
Uh, oh, and I'll go ahead and show it there too. Okay, so um, so that now each time I start the program, the timer resets at zero, um, and I'm not really sure why it uh, it keeps going even after you stop the program, but whatever. Um, we don't really care. Uh, okay, so then for the balls that become infected, uh, what I want to do is I need to have um, the time at which they became infected. Now, there is only one timer. That's global to the entire program. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new variable for the ball sprite only and call it what time was it infected. Okay, so when does the blue ball get infected? It gets infected right here. So then what I'll do is I'll set the um, infected time to whatever the timer's value is. Okay, and then I'm going to add in a conditional here that says if the infected time, uh, so uh, the timer minus the infected time, oops, if the current time minus the time we were infected is greater than, say, five seconds, then that means that we've gone through our five seconds of sickness and we should change to the recovered state. Okay, so how do we change to the recovered state? Well, under variables we need to set the state to 2, which we'll use to indicate recovered. We need to change the number of infected by minus 1 because we're no longer infected. And we need to change the number of recovered by one. We also want to change our costume. And the costume that we picked for recovered was ball C. So we'll put that here. OK. So now let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so let's run that and, all right, so what happened? They all waited five seconds and then became recovered. So why did that happen? It shouldn't have, but uh, it did. So any ideas? Well, don't all jump up at once. OK, so it happened because uh, this was running regardless of what state we were in. We only want to check the time if we've already been infected. Um, Yes, OK, so that's exactly it, right? Uh, time is in seconds. Um, yes, yeah, so 60 seconds would be a minute. Uh, but the reason that they all became pink was because this part right there, we need to check, is it true that um, the state equals 0 and that we've, or sorry, the state equals 1. Um, OK, so now we just put all of this stuff there. So we only want to change from infected to recovered if we are already infected and it's been five seconds since our infection time. OK, so now let's run it and see what happens. OK, so we're starting to get uh, pink ones. Um, and the uh, 
we're, we're going to have to deal with this clumping issue. I'm going to have to figure out a better way to do that because they're not changing color correctly. Um, and that's probably because they're getting stuck in the code somehow. Um, so that I'll have to mess with. But you guys did see that uh, some of them were pink. Um, okay, so let's run it again. So some of them became pink after infection. Okay, so like this one here, for example. Well, assuming they don't all get stuck. Yeah, so some of them are becoming pink. Okay. Um, all right, so we got some bugs to work out still. Uh, but basically, the, the bugs that we've got are, uh, that we need to figure out are the clumping that's happening, okay, and that's just because of how we're doing the movement. Um, uh, and then, yeah, when the pink ones touch the infected, they become reinfected, okay, and that's because um, we had this business here, uh, where if you were touching um, the... Um, if you were touching orange, they became reinfected. Okay, so that means that we've messed something up. Um, and a couple of other problems that we still have are uh, the bouncing. So, for example, when a pink one touches something, it does not, well, it did bounce, okay? And that was this part here happening, okay? But it also changed costume. Oh, and that's why, right there. Um, so we need to take this uh, little bit there and we need to change the costume here. Okay, so that should keep them from becoming reinfected when, once they become pink. Okay, so there we go. That fixed that problem. Um, so we've still got the problem of things getting stuck, uh, although it looks like a bunch of things got unstuck there, which is kind of nice. Um, the other problem that we have is that um, um, things are not uh, correctly bouncing. Yeah, so see, we had that little bug there. The, the different colored balls aren't correctly bouncing off of each other. Okay, and this blue guy, um, well, he's not bouncing off of the pink ones. He should be. And nor is this original infected ball. This original infected ball should get better after five seconds, uh, just like any of the other ones. Okay, so we still got a bunch of things to work out here uh, for how to make this uh, work a little bit better. Um, but I hope you're starting to get the ideas here. So the two main things that I wanted to... Uh, to hit with uh, with today's discussion is the idea that some of the variables here uh, can be specific to an object and other variables can be general to the entire program and the idea of cloning so you can make sort of copies of an individual object and each copy gets its own version of those local variables. So we had the variable, um, for example, ball speed, which was random, and each ball, even though they were all copies and running basically the same program, had their own individual little instance of ball speed and also their own little instance of ball direction. Uh, and so, uh, but you can't do that with global variables. So some of the variables we made global, like the infected number or the recovered number or the susceptible number and other variables we made local like ball speed ball direction state infected time and so on okay so uh, i think uh, i'll go ahead and take any questions that you guys have for today and um, uh, if you don't have any questions then uh, have a good weekend uh, pay attention to canvas uh, assignments are going up and uh, got some updates to on course stuff to give you guys so uh, have have that canvas so any questions
All right, doesn't look like we got any questions. So type in Discord or in the uh, the stream chat if you've got any. All right, no questions? All right, well, I'll go ahead and end the stream then and get this uploaded to YouTube. So have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you.